sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we live for you. We sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Let's sing Jesus the name. Jesus the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Sing Jesus again. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we live for you. We sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me. With your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and Perfect love. So here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together wonder. For to me, here I am, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me and holy. Cause holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love.
love to those around me. And then Jesus, that's what we pray, that you show us who you are, that you fill us with your love. God, we thank you that you lead us into all truth, and we thank you for this moment now to know you more, to dive into fellowship and communion and community with you. We thank you for the gift of this moment. Amen. Do you like rules? You know, I know there are people out there who really enjoy knowing the lines to not be crossed. You like order and responsibility and direction and an understanding of expectations. You now, many of us are gathering in neighborhood church today and maybe the host for your neighborhood church has shared some semblance of house rules with you all. Of take your shoes off, throw recyclables in the appropriate place, leave the good wine right where it's at, uh, don't color on the walls, you know, normal stuff. Now for some of us, we appreciate knowing what the rules are. And for others of us, if not coloring on the walls is a rule, then we have like a deep-seated inclination to find a marker to color the walls with. Now, I am one of those people. When it comes to rules, I don't like them. Um, there's something about me that really dislikes being told what to do. My mother-in-law told me the other day that it's almost like when she tells me what to do, I just do the opposite of what I'm told. And I told her that she's getting a glimpse of what it was like for my parents to raise me. Now, I have a lot of empathy for my parents. I know I wasn't an easy child. Um, now, both of my parents are, and my sister are rule followers. So much so that when people who, meet, who know me well meet my parents and my sister, the most common comment is, you guys are great. Where did Steve come from? They, they literally say those words. So, taking all of this into consideration, it appeared strange when my parents sat us down in the middle of my eighth grade year and presented us with the Ingold Family Constitution. Now, a family constitution in and of itself is different. But it got really strange when I recognized how many of the rules within the Constitution seemed to be directed at me. We will be nice to one another. The three of them are nice. I vacillate. We will make every effort not to argue with one another. They don't argue much. I think it's fun to argue. We recognize that we're never, we're never too old or too cool to say I love you and to give or receive a hug or kiss. Remember, I was in eighth grade, a boy. I was the epitome of too old and too cool. Now, one time, based on my dad's interpretation, I, bro I broke one of the rules that stated we will honor God when I brought music into the home that my dad thought wasn't God-honoring. Um, he was furious at my collection of burned punk rock CDs filled with cuss words, and so he decided to snap every CD I owned in half. Now, he got so worked up and so in the zone that he even snapped some of the worship CDs I had in there. Now here's the issue that I figured out earlier this week. One of the rules was we will respect one another's property. Well, 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 pops. Looks like someone has some confession and rest restitution they need to get on. Now fortunately for me, my dad isn't here to defend himself. Uh, because if he were, I imagine he would say that the heart of the Constitution wasn't to create some conditional scenario where we were constantly monitoring what rules were being followed and which ones we weren't. No, the heart of the document was to proclaim who we would be as the Ingold family and how we would live in that reality. Which I would argue with because I love to argue. You know, as we continue on in our Exodus series, we find ourselves in chapters 20 through 24 of the second book in the Old Testament. And this section of, chap of, of chapters is all about rules, all about laws, all about commandments. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, I bet most, if not all of us, have heard of the Ten Commandments. So right now, I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you and recite all Ten Commandments in order. I'll give you time. I'm kidding. That would be a challenge for most of us. So let's run through them really quick. Um, the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. 
honor your father and mother unless they murder all your CDs in a fit of rage. Oh, look what's next. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Now, after Moses received these commandments and gave them to the people, they saw lightning and, and they heard, th heard thunder. Um, they heard a trumpet and see the mountain in smoke. And all of a sudden, all the Israelites get really scared and they're like, hey, Moses, you know what? We're fine if you just talk to God without us. We'll just kind of hang out here and, and you go away to talk to God. Um, we'll listen to you, but we're, we're good on the whole talking to God thing. That will probably kill us. So there's the Ten Commandments. But as we've said throughout this series, and anytime we open up scripture, this is an ancient text that needs to be read with ancient eyes. So how do we read these commandments with ancient eyes? And how do we do the theology to find our application for our context today? Well, first we must understand that the Israelites are not the first people to invent law. By the time the Israelites show up, um, other more ancient civilizations had been producing laws and rules for quite some time. Now, maybe you've heard of the Hammurabi Code, written in the 18th century BC, containing 300 laws, some of which are strikingly similar to these Ten Commandments, as well as some of the other laws found in chapters 21 through 24 of Exodus. Um, even the, the description of God handing down the laws to the Israelites is very similar to how kings made treaties with their subjects in the first and second millennia BC. They would describe blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. But there are three, three important distinctions that need to be made. First, the preface to these Ten Commandments really matters. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. As we've learned through Exodus, in chapters 1 through 15, God saves first and then he gives laws. He claims the people as his own and then shows them how you live out of that reality. And go back to the beginning of Israel's story in Genesis 12 and you'll find God saying, I am your God and you are my people. He's been very clear the whole time. Israel, being God's people, is not conditional. Now, as a side note, the ancient Israelites spent a lot of time making their relationship with God conditional, maybe to mirror the cultural landscape around them and how other religions functioned, um, with a lot of if-then statements that we find in Scripture. But God made it very clear that they were his people. Second, um, God is the one handing down these laws. In Exodus 24, we read that the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. In other ancient societies, kings wrote the laws. In the Old Testament, God writes the laws. And because God writes them, it means that everyone is sub subject to these laws, even kings. Which, if you know anything about Israelite history, the kings didn't exactly nail it at keeping these laws. And then third, no other religion had their rules embedded into a story. Their, their rules sounded similar, and you could probably even make the argument that these rules are a moral code found in Genesis 1 through 3 for all of humanity. But every other ancient civilization just had a list of rules. And as much as this is a list of commandments that we just went through, these are all about God reaching out to his people. But that's not how the Israelite Ten Commandments are presented. These laws are woven into uh, the story of Israel's rise from Abraham's family to an eventual monarchy. Th these laws are part of a larger story, a story of God's relationship with his people, and more specifically, what is needed for establishing Israelite society moving forward. So with that said, hopefully we are, are starting to grasp their context a bit more. But in order to draw out some application for us, let's take a closer look at some of these rules. Um, I think it's important to recognize that in the same way we've talked about the necessity of doing theology when reading scripture and discovering application, the ancient Israelites did the exact same thing. In Exodus, the first place we read the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath because God rested on the seventh day after creating. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, they are to keep the Sabbath in commemoration of being freed from Egypt. So why are they different? 
Well, most biblical scholars agree that this shift happened because the older legal tradition of Exodus was being reimagined for a new time and new place, a, a new context, which is what we also do, do when we read scripture in our context. It's also necessary to recognize that these Ten Commands are, are pretty ambiguous. How do we follow rules that are ambiguous? Like, don't steal, but what if I'm stealing to feed my starving parents that I'm supposed to honor? Don't kill, but what if someone breaks into my home and it's the only means of protecting my family? What exactly does it mean to keep all these commandments? Now, unfortunately, these commands did not come with an FAQ section about how to keep them, and, and is why Judaism, to this day, has plenty of debate on how exactly to keep the Torah. Even as we continue reading the, the next few chapters, there is plenty to unpack. After the Ten Commandments, we enter a new section in chapters 21 through 24 known as the Book of the Covenant. And in the Book of the Covenant, it lays out the laws around worship and the treatment of others. And remember, biblical laws have an ancient context, and it takes some work to figure out how, to what extent, or if we should follow those rules. I mean, even in the opening section of the Book of the Covenant, Yahweh, God, makes sure to include this in what we have is verse 26 of chapter 20. And do not go up to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed. I mean, that's fascinating and helpful stuff. If you don't have any context and someone took a screenshot of me with this verse next to me, I can only imagine what people think we're teaching on. But it gets even more intriguing when we see that some of the laws in the Book of the Covenant conflict with other biblical laws found in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. I'll give you an example. In Exodus, Hebrew male slaves can go free after seven years, but female slaves cannot. In Deuteronomy, both male and female slaves may gain their freedom, but in Leviticus, it is forbidden to have Hebrew slaves at all. Uh, to take this a little further, the Book of the, of the Covenant contains one of the most popular laws in the entire Bible, starting in verse 23. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, this may sound vengeful, vengeful to us, but to ancient ears, they would understand that the purpose of this rule was to ensure that a punishment matched but never exceeded the crime. Unfortunately, slaves were not given the same rights as free men, so their punishment would often exceed the crime, as slaves were viewed as property and not people, which is also similar to the view that a virgin daughter was property to her father until she, be, she became married. I mean, cue the moral conundrums that Christians have to deal with today. Does God endorse slavery? Are women property? I mean, Yahweh is the one who very clearly said those words right here in these verses. But, and we'll get to this more in a moment, we know Jesus and we have clear answers to those questions. Hopefully, we recognize that it takes some theology to understand and arrive at Christ-centered conclusions. You see, Christian theology cannot simply rest on what the Bible says. Theology is all about building a discerning connection between ancient and modern times. We must do theology, which whenever I say that, I mean precisely what we're doing right now. Doing theology means connecting an ancient text to modern times. But again, this section of Exodus isn't simply a list of rules. It is woven into a larger story of the Israelites. It's a significant part of what it means to live in the reality that they are God's people. The, the section ends in chapter 24 with a ceremony. Um, Moses reads these words and people respond with a resounding pledge of obedience. In this moment, the Israelites have willingly entered into a binding agreement with Yahweh. They are ready as obedient and faithful people to enter the land that God has promised them. Well, that's what they agreed to at least. Um, they didn't always do a great job of keeping that. But the ancient Israelites in this moment have signed on the dotted line. Yahweh is their God, and they are Yahweh's people. But the question for us when we're doing theology is to ask, did we sign on the same dotted line? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that we are God's and he is ours. 
If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, then you have been adopted into the family of believers, and with that comes a way of living in that new reality. But no, in the sense that it is something we should ever, we should never make conditional. Because of Jesus' victory over death on the cross, all people are welcome in the kingdom of God. We are not saved by works. We are not saved because we were born in a specific time period to a specific family or, or people group in a specific context. We are saved and have the opportunity to be saved from our old selves because of Jesus. Also, no, in the sense that this was a covenant between Yahweh and the ancient Israelites. What we just read is not a covenant between us today and God. It has no authority over us. The Old Testament is a history of the ancient Israelites. It tells us a great deal about God and leads us directly to Jesus. So, before I go on, I want to make this very clear. In no way am I saying that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, or the Ten Commandments is insignificant. This matters so much, and it's so important, and it's why we've studied Genesis and Exodus so far this year, because we feel it is necessary to understand and wrestle with. But according to Jesus, according to Jesus himself, he fulfilled that covenant. He didn't abolish it, he didn't get rid of it, but he fulfilled it. It's like when, when my wife orders something on Amazon, which I think happens about 76 times a day. Um, when we receive whatever it is she ordered, the order has been fulfilled. There's, there's still a history of it, there's information about the product, but the order has been completed because we received it. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled the old covenant and gave his disciples and us today a new covenant. When we sign on the dotted line to follow Jesus, we are signing on to Jesus's new covenant. So again, the question that is kind of begged through this whole, this whole scenario is, do the Ten Commandments given to the ancient Israelites have any authority over us today? Well, to, to answer this question, we first have to understand what the new covenant is. As Jesus sat down with his disciples for what would be his last Passover meal, he told them that he wouldn't be with them much longer. Stress and anxiety likely filled the room because things have been tense lately, and if Jesus knows he won't be around much longer, it's not because he's going on vacation. If Jesus goes missing, then the disciples knew things weren't looking very good for them either. But knowing what was ahead, Jesus knew he had something vitally important to share with his closest followers. The moment that all the other moments, all the miraculous healings, the wise but controversial teachings, the, the miracles, everything to this point led to what Jesus was about to say next. And so he leaned in and continued to talk to his disciples. And he said, a new command I give you. A new command? Like a, another one? You see, the Jewish people had the, six, the, the Ten Commandments that we're talking about, but they also had 600 plus other commands that had been developed and put together to try and do their best to stick with the covenant, the covenant that God had made with their people. I mean, Jesus had already ventured down this path before in a conversation with a lawyer when, when the lawyer was trying to figure out what the greatest command was. And Jesus said, well, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he added, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said that all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands. Everything's boiled down to that. So why then do we need a third? Not to mention only God had the authority to add commands, but then again only God had the authority to forgive sin, give sight to the blind, and raise the dead, and, and Jesus did all those things, so maybe he does have the authority to make a new command. And this was his new command, a new command I give you. Love one another. That's the new command. Love, a verb, one another. Go love. I mean, I just imagine what Jesus would, have, would, would be like as a, as a mediator between any married couple, uh, friends, or family members in an argument. Jesus, he said this, and, and she said that, and Jesus would be like, all right, hold on, hold on. I got the solution. Ready? Go love each other. <laughs> That's his law. That's his rule. That's his command. But he wasn't finished. He, he kept going. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. And then he added this part. He said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You see, abiding by the golden rule, simply doing for others what one hoped others would do in return, was so old covenant. 
Jesus took the old covenant and raised the bar. Love each other as Jesus loved. This love was anchored in a human being sitting with the disciples. It made it real and personal. Love each other as I have loved you, which is such an important piece of this that we can't miss. Our goal as followers of Jesus Christ is to be transformed into Christ-likeness, which only happens through surrender to Jesus. Jesus is the one who not only shows us how to love like he loves, but enables us to do so through the Holy Spirit working and moving within us. But we have to pursue a lifetime, moment by moment, surrender to Jesus. It all starts there. And and, and when we read this verse today, like when we read that to to love one another as Jesus loved us, we automatically think of the cross. Like that's immediately where our mind jumps to. But Jesus' disciples weren't thinking about the cross that night because the cross hadn't happened yet. Instead, in that moment, they thought back to all of Jesus' words and actions that they had personally witnessed over the last three years. The, the miracles, the, the caring for the marginalized and the oppressed, the moments where, where he went so out of his way to, to care for people that based on their tradition shouldn't have been cared for. That's how he loved. And those are the, the very words and actions we have recorded throughout the Gospels. Summarizing the entire Jewish law into two commandments was a brilliant and strategic move by Jesus. Just as the Old Covenant included laws to live by that were engraved on stone tablets, Jesus' new covenant included instructions for his followers to live by as well. Instructions that were engraved in their hearts and their minds. And a lot easier to remember than 613 commandments. One rule, love one another. And if it feels like we're, like we're throwing out the Old Covenant and the Ten Commandments, I encourage you to read Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And you'll see how he took those Ten Commandments and took them so much further. So no, we, we aren't required. The answer to this question is no, we are not required to obey most of the commandments found in the Old Covenant. However, participants in the new covenant are expected to obey the one command Jesus gave as part of his new covenant. As I have loved you, you must love one another. It's easier to remember, but so challenging and difficult to constantly and completely live out. And just a secret between us, if you do follow Jesus' one command, you will be keeping the Ten Commandments but you'll also just be scratching the surface of loving as Jesus loves. And if we want to know what that looks like and and how we do that, again, look at the words and actions of Jesus and then imitate him. In the same way that the Israelites were given commands to understand what it meant to be God's people and what it meant to live in that reality, Jesus gave us a command to understand what it means to follow and what it means to live in his reality. Now, I'll close with this. One of, the, one of the stipulations in the Ingold Family Constitution reads like this. We will always seek to ask, what would Jesus do in every situation we face? Now, this is the 90s version that even came with bracelets. I'm pretty sure my mom and dad made us wear. But it's the 90s version of one of the core values of Cornerstone Fellowship, which is we will always ask, what does love require in every situation we face? In hindsight, I'm really grateful for the heart behind those rules my parents gave us all those years ago. Because their goal was that living in the reality of being an ingold meant that we would all live in the reality of following Jesus. But based on the understanding I have today, I think they could have saved themselves some time. Because just putting that one rule would have captured the heart of all the other rules which is the same exact thing that Jesus did when he gave the new command. He he captured the heart of what all those old rules were all about. A rule that wasn't centered in Jesus' authority, but found its direction and inspiration in Jesus' love. A rule, a, a law, a code, a command that is so beautiful, so powerful, and so compelling. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. May that always be the guiding principle of this church 
and for each and every single one of us. Let's pray. Father God, I, I feel like it's so necessary to start by saying we are longing for and striving to be surrendered to you. We know that as your Holy Spirit works and moves in us and through us, that we become more and more like Jesus. And we want nothing more than to honor you by imitating Jesus. So God, empower us to, to love as you love. Empower us to protect and care for and pursue the things that you desire because we desperately want to follow the one command. We desperately want to become more like Jesus. God, I pray that as anyone interacts with someone that's a part of this church, part of your church, that love, care, kindness, generosity, inclusivity would be the foundational values of who we are, that people recognize and, and, they, and they see exactly who we're who we're trying to be like. So God, let us not get hung up on, am I following this rule, am I following that rule, but so concerned with, with imitating Jesus, so concerned with imitating the one command that he gave. Thank you, God, for giving us the new covenant. Thank you for allowing us to live under your love. We adore you, we praise you, we honor you, and we pray all of this in the matchless, powerful, beautiful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.